So, since they're only lending the spread, and uh, one party will earn, one party will lose, we got to talk about settlement. How, are they, how do they settle out? Well, here's the funny thing. Most contracts uh, uh, will settle out on or near the expiration date, uh, which is usually at the end of the period. For the forward rate agreement, the settlement is at T1, at the beginning of the period, not T2. T1, not T2. Why? Because the purpose of the FRA is not to secure the loan, but rather to secure the rate. You get that. Let's go to the next point. Since the market rate, and hence the payoff, is known at T1, why wait? What we're saying here is that once we get to T1, the market rate for this period of time will be known. So if we know the contract rate, we know the market rate, we know the spread, we know what T2 is, we know what T1 is, and we know the value of the loan, we can already calculate what the payoff at T2 is. So let's do that. And, and then we'll figure out why we settle up at T1. So what's the payoff at T2 for the lender? Well, you'll recall that the lender is going to lend uh, uh, an amount of money, L. And they're going to make the difference between the contract rate and the market rate. We're only concerned about the spread because that's the payoff. The, the market rate is what each of the lender and borrower are going to realize by doing their own thing in the market. We're just locking in the spread. And it's for T2 minus T1 period of time. So that's the payoff to the lender. Let's just make sure we're clear. The payoff to the lender at T2 is that. That, that you should see. Whatever the spread is now at T1, we'll already know what RM is. So we can calculate what the payoff at T2 is. However, remember now, I said it's settled at T1, not T2. This is the payoff at T2. Well, how do we get it to T1? Well, we must discount it. Let me use another color so that we can uh, be very clear that we're doing something different here. We'll discount this backwards in time to T1. <clears throat> so how do we discount that? Well, we have to have some discount rate. Well, that's the market rate. So it's 1 plus RM, but we have to put it in the right period of time, so it's T2 minus T1. If that's one year, then it's 1 plus RM. Remember, when we're discounting, we divide by, right? So if RM is 2%, we would divide the payoff by 1.02. That would bring it back one year. So all of this now is the payoff at T1. <clears throat> so to get the payoff at T1, we must first calculate the payoff at T2, then discount it back one period at RM. At T1, we will know RM. We will know RK because that's the contract rate. We will know RM because we know that at T1. We already know what T2 and T1 is. It's defined in the forward rate agreement. Since we know all the variables, we can already calculate the payoff at T2. We're just discounting it backwards to T1. So that's for the, uh, uh, for the lender. Uh, what about the borrower? For the borrower... It's pretty much the same thing, but you'll recall that there was one term that was different. The borrower is borrowing L, but has a belief that the market rate will be greater than the contract rate for the same period of time. And, of course, that's got to be discounted back, 1 plus RM, uh, T2 minus T1. Notice that if this is a positive number, this is a negative number. These two, summed together, will equal zero. So there's the payoff for the borrower at T1 and the payoff for the lender at T1. So, let's uh, give it some life. Let's give it an example, shall we? So, let's uh, take a... We're going to enter into an FRA today. Uh, here's T1. Here's time T2. And this is in three years. Uh, and this will be for three months. So, we're going to enter into a forward rate agreement which will start in three years for three months, and it'll only be three months. The contract rate, RK, uh, is going to be 4%, and the loan amount is going to be $100 million. So, if at time T1, we look at the spot curve and we see that RM is 4.5%, ah, uh, well, now look at this. There are certain things we can say right away. 
we can say that the lender is wrong. The lender agreed to lend at 4%. The market rate is 4.5%, so the lender is going to have some splaining to do. So let's see what, uh, what, uh, what happens to the lender here. And we're just going to use uh, the, the payoff. Let's just f figure out the payoff at T2 first. Well, we just follow along. L, well, is the 100 million. Uh, RK, the rate at which they uh, uh, agreed to lend was 0.4. The rate uh, at uh, the market rate is now 0 0.045. And T2 was three years, three months, which is 3.25 years. T1 is three years. Uh, and if we solve for this, we will get negative 125,000 because we'll have a negative half a percent here for a quarter of a year, which will be uh, a negative uh, 1.125 percent times the 100 million, 125k. So the lender is down 125k by entering into this agreement. They're 125,000 dollars worse off. So the lender owes the borrower this much money right now. But it doesn't owe them $125,000. That's the payoff at T2. The lender loses $125,000. But at T1, at T1, they will lose the $125,000 discounted backwards three months, which is 1 plus RM, the market rate, 0 0.045 times T2 minus T1, which is 0.25, or you could have just did divided by 4, it's the same thing, and we'll get negative 123,609. So, they enter into this agreement three years from now, they observe what the rate in the market is, they can calculate the payoff at T2, discount it back at the, uh, at the market discount rate, the lender in the contract, the lender, would now transfer to the borrower, the $123,609 for being wrong on the contract. At any given time, in all the FRAs, if at the end of the year you say, okay, let me add up all the winners and losers in the FRAs, uh, you'll find that 50% of them were right and 50% of them were wrong. That's, that's just the nature. It's a 50-50 market. It's a zero-sum game. It's not a creation of wealth. It's a transfer of wealth. And you'll find that most derivatives are nothing but a transfer of wealth because it's a transfer of risk. Derivatives do not eliminate risk. They transfer risk to someone else. You still got to be paid for that risk. Somebody else gets paid. Somebody loses. So there we go. That's nice and simple, right? That's why we settle off at T1 because we know what the payoff will be at T2. All the variables are known, so why wait? Let's just discount it backwards and pay me now. There we go. So when, uh, when you and I enter into a forward rate agreement, um, what does it cost? Do I owe you any money? Do you owe me any money? Uh, does any money change hands at all or is this just free to enter into? Well, yes and no. <clears throat> if the rate in the contract we're agreeing on a contract today, and let's say it's going to start in three years. We're going to agree on a rate today. If the rate we agree on is the forward rate implied by the zero curve or the spot curve, if it is the same thing, then I don't owe you anything and you don't owe me anything because there is no premium or discount over what the forward rate is. Now, when we get three years in the future, the real rate may be different than the forward rate, but we won't know that till we get into the future. But when we enter into the agreement today, if, if our contract rate is the same as the forward rate, then there, is no, then there is no money that has to change hands. So what this is saying, RK equals RF, is that the FRA rate is the forward rate. But here's the, uh, here's the thing. There is no reason why it should be. In other words, when we enter into an FRA, there is nothing in the FRA that says it must be. It can be whatever we want it to be. You and I can enter into a, a, an agreement where the, the contract rate is triple what the forward rate is. We can do that if we want to. I, I forget the reasons why, but we can do it if we want to. So, if it can be done, there must be some mechanism to say, well, hang on now. If I'm going to agree to something different than what the forward rate implies, <clears throat> I either need to be compensated now because I'm making a bad, a bad choice based on where the forward rate is, 
or you need to compensate me. Or, or sorry, I need to compensate you, or you need to compensate me. So there, we have to have some way to figuring out, well, what's the value of the contract when we enter it? So the easiest way to do this is to say, well, when we enter it, let's calculate the payoff at time T2 using the forward rate. We don't know the market rate, but we know the forward rate, so we can calculate the payoff at time T2. So our payoff will be, how much money are we talking about? The difference between the contract rate and the implied forward rate for the period of time that we're talking about. You can see here very quickly that if the contract rate is the implied forward rate, then the payoff, I'll write it up here, payoff at T2 <clears throat> would equal zero. The payoff at T2 would equal zero. And so what is the present value of zero dollars in the future? Zero dollars any time in the future, the present value of that will always be zero, which means the value of the forward rate agreement when the two are equal is zero. But when they're not, when I agree to a rate greater than the implied forward rate, you got to pay me some money. Now, if we want to figure out what this is going to be worth at T2, now keep in mind, we're not talking about the market rate. We're not talking about the actual real payoff in the market. We're just saying, I'm entering into a contract today that says that the rate is significantly different than what the implied forward rate is. So I've either got to pay for that or I've got to be paid for that. If the rate is higher, if I'm agreeing to a rate higher than the forward rate, it has value for me. But it has this much value at T2. We want to know how much money changes hands today. So we need the net present value of this, which means we discount it. And when we discount, what do we do? It's a negative. Remember, when we're moving forward in time, the power term is positive. When we're moving backwards in time, it's negative. It's negative what? R2, the interest rate, times T2. Well, what is R2? Well, I'll get to what R2 is in a minute. But we discounted back, and that will be the value of the forward rate agreement. So let's be clear about what our terms uh, uh, here is. This is just the difference between the two rates. It's the rate of the contract, the difference between the contract rate and the implied forward rate. So we're just looking at the spread between the two. If I'm getting the forward rate, this is zero. So I'm just looking at the spread, the difference for the forward rate. This is discounted continuously, discounted continuously to the FRA date. Not just to T1. Notice we're discounting it all the way back to today, the day we enter the FRA. In other words, it is the it is today's net present value. R2. What is R2 up here? We know what T2, T2 is the length of time until the payoff. We know what T2 is. R2 is the zero rate. Is the zero rate for the period of time from T0 to T2. So if we find an investment, a two, uh, two or three or four year, however long T2 is, we find this investment at whatever percent, that is R2. That's what R2 is going to be. It is the zero rate. So remember, uh, we, we did it earlier where we had the years 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we had the, our Z rates. And from that, we calculated uh, what our forward, uh, uh, our forward rates would be. And we had 3%, 4%, 4.6%. So if R2 were three years, uh, we would just go down three years. OK, uh, the zero rate for a, a zero coupon bond implies a 4.6% uh, uh, compounded, whether annually, semi-annual, whatever, it's 4.6%. That would be what we're discounting the whole thing back by. So we're going to discount back on whatever rate happens to correspond to the T2 time, whatever T2 is, whatever the Z rate is for that period of time. That's what that is. I know that sounds a, a, a bit uh, confusing, but I'm going to show you a nice example on the next screen. We're not done yet here. We just have one more point to make. This is the payoff. This is the value of the forward rate agreement, whatever it happens to be. 
on the this is for one side of the contract if we want to include the other side of the contract it would be the same as the loan and we just reverse the the spread instead of rk minus rf it's rf minus rk t2 minus t1 e to the negative r2 t2 so what we're saying here is that if rk is above rf this term will be positive but rf minus rk this term will now be negative and the two of them will equal the same the same amount in other words the the absolute value of the value of the forward rate agreement for party 1 is the same as the absolute value of the forward rate agreement for party two, whichever they happen to be, uh, one will be positive, one will be negative. In other words, one side will transfer money to the other side on day one because there is already a difference between the contract rate and the forward rate. The forward rate already has value today. It's an OTC contract. So it's not marked to market every day, but if it was marked to market every day, as the zero curve changes, the implied forward rate would change. And when the implied forward rate changes, you can calculate the daily value of this forward rate agreement. So if I get a year into a two-year uh, FRA and I say, you know what, it's not going in my favor, I don't like it, I may be able to talk to the other side and say, can we settle up now? We have a way of settling up because we know exactly what the payoff would be. So we can settle up if we want. This is an example of a contract that can be marked to market. And with all of the uh, OTC uh, derivative scandal that's been uh, that's happened uh, with the uh, subprime housing market, the CDO, CDO Square, CDO Cube, uh, one of the uh, uh, regulations in Dodd-Frank uh, for the OTC market is that if there are some well-defined contracts that can be moved to a clearinghouse, they must be. This is one that can be moved to a clearinghouse because it can quite easily be marked to market every day because every day we can observe what the implied forward rate is. The contract rate will be a constant. The forward rate will change as all the zero rates change every day, as they do by how many basis points this will change. It is easy to see how we can mark to market this, which means if you can mark to market this, um, you're talking about a situation where two companies will enter into a forward rate agreement and there'll be margin required on both sides and maybe there'll be uh, some regular mark to market of this. And it just makes the, the, the entire uh, OTC derivatives market a little safer when, both, when, when we can reduce counterparty risk this way. <music>